This film deals with the theory of the S-1 bomb site, but there's nothing theoretical about this part of it. You're looking at a B-24 on a bombing run over enemy-held territory, Japanese territory. Pilot to Bombardier. We're going in, Scotty. That's right, Scotty. Make these next few seconds count, every one of them. Hope you've done your homework, Scotty. Because this is what they trained you for, these 28 seconds coming up. That's it, just 28 seconds. We're going in close this run. Pilot to Bombardier. On course. 28 seconds. Count them. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, 1,006, 1,007, 1,008. 1,026, 1,027, 1,028. Bombs away. Nice pitching, fella. Finally got that molasses on you, and you're so sorry down there. We go home now, please. Yes, yeah, Scotty, that bomb site is pretty good, too. No wonder you hate to let it get out of your sight. Sort of like leaving part of your brain behind. And he's not so far from wrong. It does get to feel like part of your brain. But don't think it wasn't a headache to begin with. It darn near drove me nuts, trying to figure it out from a blackboard. I've been allergic to blackboards anyway, ever since the fifth grade. And this stuff could throw anybody. Tangents, cotangents, secants, particularly when all you wanted to do was to get out there and drop those bombs. Then one day, all of a sudden, I started to catch on. Here's what happened. All I had to do was imagine I had an ordinary telescope in my hands. That's really all it is. Because when you turn any of these knobs, all you do is move the optics the way you would a telescope. Get the idea? Just a telescope. Of course, there are plenty of gadgets hooked up with it, but it's still just a telescope in the nose of an airplane. So the first thing to figure out is how to keep that telescope on the target while the airplane is going a dozen ways at the same time. For instance, suppose the airplane starts to pitch and roll. You haven't a chance of holding the telescope steady just with your hands. So they built a gyroscope into the site to keep the telescope from moving with the motion of the plane and to give us a vertical reference line. But an airplane doesn't only pitch and roll. It also yaws. That's why there's another gyroscope holding the telescope steady in azimuth. That gives us a directional reference line. With both gyros connected, no matter how the airplane gets pushed around, up or down or side to side, the telescope is kept steady. OK, the telescope is steady. Now let's see how we use it to find the target. Remember that diagram on the blackboard? The one that illustrated the range problem? You have an airplane and a target. The airplane is coming in at a certain altitude, decided in advance. At a certain point, the bomb is released.
And there's the whole diagram, except for the labels. The first one is altitude. Since we can calculate from that how long it takes the type of bomb we're using to fall, altitude is also called time of fall. Then, time of fall distance. That's how far the airplane will travel in the time it takes the bombs to fall. And, of course, time of fall distance equals whole range, which shows where the bomb would have struck if we were flying in a vacuum. The distance between where the bomb actually landed, the actual range, and the whole range is the trail. The line from the release point to the target makes an angle with a vertical line to the ground. This is the dropping angle. Now we can go to work. The first job is to pick up the target. There's a knob on the sight so you can move the telescope independently of the gyroscope. You turn it until you're on the target. Or if you want to think of what you'd see through the eyepiece, like this. Now you're on it. But suppose you took your hand off that knob and let only the gyro control it from here on. Here's what would happen. Remember, if left by itself, the gyroscope holds the telescope steady. But it doesn't keep us on the target. The airplane, of course, is flying at a constant speed. So, to keep the telescope on the target, it must be driven down at a rate proportional to that speed. It's easy to see why. For any given altitude and speed, there's a definite rate at which the telescope has to be tipped down. In the old sites, the bombardier had to do that by hand, which was plenty tough. It's not so tough now in the S1, because a motor does it. All the bombardier has to do is adjust the speed of the motor till the sight stays on the target by itself. And believe me, that motor's something to be thankful for, with all the other things a bombardier has on his mind in the 28 seconds of a run. All right, let's take another bombing run while we look at the next step. After we get on the target manually, we adjust the speed of the motor until the telescope stays on the target by itself. By now we know how to stay on the target, but we're not up there just to look at it through a telescope. We've got another little problem. When do you drop that bomb? Here? 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 Well, it's too late now. Remember that basic diagram? Remember the dropping angle? You release the bomb when your sighting angle is the same as your dropping angle. Like that. All right. You matched angles and hit the target. But how do you measure that angle? Well, suppose you're flying at a high altitude. Or flying low. Or maybe you're flying slow. Or coming in fast. It can be any of these. There's one thing to think of. The faster you fly, or the higher, the farther you'll go in the time it takes the bomb to fall. Your time of fall distance, like your time of fall, will vary. And naturally, your actual range will change with it. Distances out in the air like that are a little hard to measure. So right inside the bomb site, there's a contraption that sets up those distances in scale. A vertical bar, which we can adjust up and down to any position we want. And a horizontal bar, which we slide back and forth. The vertical bar is scaled so that before the run starts, it can be set for whatever the altitude or time of fall is. Then the horizontal bar can be preset to allow for trail. 
Remember how the motor has to run at a certain speed in order to keep the telescope on the target? Setting that speed control at the right spot to match our speed also moves the horizontal bar, and that gives the actual range. And it also gives us the one thing we've needed most of all, our dropping angle. In other words, we have something to match the sighting angle to. Now imagine your telescope is pivoted at the top of the triangle and that when the telescope parallels the diagonal bar, electric contacts will close. When your sighting and dropping angles are equal, the bomb is automatically released. If you look at it this way, that's pretty good shooting. But looking down from up there, let's see what we get. Bombs away. Right on the... Uh-oh. Maybe I meant bombardiers away. I neglected just one little thing, that getting the range is only the half of it. Sure, sure, I knew better. I'm the kind of a guy that has trouble getting more than one thing in my head at a time. I had the range problem doped out okay. But when it came to azimuth, I had to start all over again. You know, thinking. I used a hole in the floor for a target. Suppose I was coming in like this. First thing you always do, just the way you do with range, is turn a knob that moves your telescope free of the airplane. Then you find your target. But suppose you stop turning that knob. Remember, the azimuth gyro will keep the telescope pointing in the same direction. So of course your line of sight will drift off the target. And of course, with a wind, it will do the same thing, only more so. That's drift. And here's what it looks like through the eyepiece. Well, what do you do about that? Here's one thing. You could turn the telescope back towards the target and at the same time, turn the airplane so it follows up the movement of the optics. Trouble is, that way, you'd practically have to fly in circles to get over the target, because you're only turning your airplane as fast as you turn the telescope. So what you should do is turn the airplane a whole lot faster. What you're really trying to do, of course, is to get your ground track to coincide with your sight line. Here we started off with zero heading, so we're drifting off to the left. Now we turn the optics back toward the target. At the same time, we turn the aeroplane, only much faster. Watch that ground track catching up with the sight line. When it does catch up, you've killed your drift, so that this is what you see in the eyepiece. All right, that killed drift. But you're still off the target. How do you get back on? Well, you turn your sight line back on the target and turn your airplane again, with one difference. This time, the amount of turn has to equal the amount you turn your optics. So by this time, I figured I was about ready to drop a bomb. That's where I was wrong. Because I forgot that the bomb always falls on the heading line of the airplane. I had to figure out one last thing, cross trail. How would I take care of that? In a way, I had to start all over again, so I could really understand just what I was doing with my telescope. Range, for instance. When I was getting range, I was just turning the telescope in a vertical plane. When I start thinking about things like vertical planes, I've got to have something to look at. So I used a piece of cardboard. Range was simple enough, and correcting for azimuth was simple, too. Then I was merely swinging the cardboard like a door on its hinges. The point is that the line of sight was still moving in a vertical plane. But that wasn't the only way I could swing that cardboard. 
Suppose you thought of that cardboard not just like a door. It could be hinged on top, too. This way, it would swing out from the bottom to either side. That means your sight line is doing this. You've tilted the telescope. And this tilting makes you fly cross-trail distance upwind. Get it? You've killed your drift, and you're on a collision course over the target. Then you tilt your telescope to one side. Getting the target under the crosshairs, you put yourself on a parallel course upwind. Think back. Remember on that bombing run there was one time when I looked up from my eyepiece? That was when I corrected for cross trail. I'd already killed my drift. While I was doing that, the bomb site had figured out for me exactly how much I had to move my ground track upwind. Then, just by matching the pointers, I tilted the telescope the correct amount. So by turning the cross trail knob to match the pointers on the cross trail dial, I moved the optics so the target was just far enough away from the fore and aft crosshair to allow for cross trail. Then all I had to do was move the plane and the optics together so that the target would be centered again. So when the warning flag popped up, I was all set. From then on, it was up to the bomb site. Right now, it seems like a lot going on in 28 seconds. Gyroscopes, range, motor drive, finding the dropping angle, setting up your triangle inside the site, killing drift, tilting your optics, all those things to take care of at the same time. Well. If you take your time now, while you're learning, get it into your head one step at a time. You'll find it'll all come out together and quick when you need it. Hey, Scotty. Coming. Good luck. We'll be waiting for you.